What's up everybody and welcome back to another video from the Scalar Learning Channel and this one is all about the PSAT and the PSAT for a lot of you guys is coming up right around the corner. So this video is everything you need to know about the PSAT. Let's do it. So first we're going to talk about the sections of the PSAT so you understand the material that is being covered. So there are four sections. The first section is going to be the evidence-based reading. So evidence-based reading is going to span 60 minutes and there's going to be five passages. That's going to be five little sections of writing that you're going to have to read about and there's going to be different topics for those passages which we'll talk about in a second. There are 47 questions in total on those five passages. So roughly around nine to ten questions per passage. The topics that are covered are science, literature, history, and social science. So the passages can cover any one of these topics. Now it doesn't require any prior knowledge of the topic being discussed. All the information you need will be right there in the passage. The reading is all about being able to mine for information, maybe analyze graphs, decipher some scientific information, but again it's not going to take a great mastery of science or history or social science, etc. The next section is the writing section. This is going to be for 35 minutes and it's going to contain four passages. Now you might hear writing and you think you actually have to write, but that's not the case. You're again reading, but you're looking at rules of grammar, syntax, organization, etc. within these passages. So there's going to be 44 questions on these four passages. These generally go a little bit quicker than the reading section, hence the shorter time constraints. And the topics that are covered, there's quite a lot. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of rules to be familiar with. Now, if you love English, if you love to read, you love to write, you're going to know a lot of these intrinsically, inherently. But if not, these are definitely some things to review. There's also some good lists that you can find online of all of the rules that you got to know. Next, we get to the math sections. Now, there's two math sections. The first of those is the no calculator section, and that's what it sounds like. You can't use a calculator on this section, and this is going to be for 25 minutes and 17 questions. Again, for the actual SAT, it's going to be a little bit longer in all of these, so this is a little bit scaled back. Normally, it'd be 20 questions in the real SAT. Here, it's only 17 questions, and the topics covered on the no calculator section are heart of algebra, passport to advanced mathematics. This is going to cover some algebra 2 topics, things like like that, advanced quadratics, whatnot, polynomials, and they're talking about problem solving and data analysis, and finally, additional topics in math that's going to cover geometry, trigonometry, stuff like that. Now, it is important to note, while there, this is a no calculator section, there is a reference sheet provided at the front of the test that's going to have some important area, volume, formulas, Pythagorean's theorem, etc. So make sure to check out that section, be familiar with it, and know where to flip back to in case you need to look one of those formulas up. Finally, we come to the last section, which is the calculator section. This is 45 minutes, so it's a little bit longer for 31 questions. And the topics are going to be the same as in no calculator. So from a conceptual standpoint, really the math sections are one and the same. And this one, you might have some bigger decimals or bigger numbers that a calculator will really come in handy with. So now let's talk about how the PSAT is scored. So again, for the reading and writing, that's going to be scored together out of a total of 760, that's gonna be the max. Versus the regular SAT, it's gonna be a maximum possible of 800. In math, the two sections again are gonna be merged together and you can again get a total of 760 for a max score of 1,520. And now we're gonna talk about how to go from the raw score to your actual scaled PSAT score. So here is the table. We've got a raw conversion table and it's it's kind of confusing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through an example of a potential score that is a raw score. I'm going to show you how it translates to your actual scaled score. So let's say you get 44 right in math. And again, 44, that's out of a possible 48 questions. So if we look at the chart, that 44 is right here. So what does that match up with in terms of the math section score on the far right? That would be a 740. So now we got a math score of 740. Now let's say on the writing section, you get 35 correct. And again, for the writing, the number of questions is 44 questions. So let's say you get 35 right on the writing. So that would be right here on the chart. What does that match up with on writing? That would be a scaled score of 31. So we got a 31 there. And then to translate it over to what it will actually be for your final score, we multiply it by 10. So now we got 310 for the writing score. So now let's say on reading, we get 39 correct, right? So that's 39 out of a possible 47 questions. So that would be right here. So we got 39 correct. 
and that would be a scaled score of 33. So again, we take that 33, we multiply it by 10, and we get 330. Now we add these three values up. We add 740, 310, and 330, and we get a composite score of 1380. And this is, by the way, quite a solid score. Again, this is out of a 1560 is a 1380. Now this is a pretty solid score and we're eventually gonna talk about how it relates to qualifying for a National Merit Scholarship and I'm gonna show you how that subscore is then calculated. First I wanna talk about why you should take the PSAT. So the PSAT is gonna be an excellent diagnostic for the real SAT because they're essentially identical. It's just that the PSAT is gonna be shorter. I have noticed in some years that the PSAT is actually quite a bit harder, at least on the math sections than the regular SAT. I mean, again, it's all in the same ballpark, but I do remember one of the practice PSATs up on the College Board website. The math section is, is pretty difficult, uh, I would say, compared to some of the SATs I've seen. But again, it's all relatively very, very similar. So this is gonna be a terrific diagnostic to see how you would do on the real SAT. Uh, and then you can also, of course, use that to help you build a nice test prep plan if you're a junior. You've got the entire year plus the beginning of next year to take the real SAT, knock it out of the park. We've also got this possibility of qualifying for a National Merit Scholarship. So that, again, only comes into play if you're a junior. Otherwise, you can't qualify. Now, the way we calculate the score in terms of a National Merit Scholarship, this is how it works. And this is very important because you'll see that the reading and writing sections are actually more important because of the way it's calculated. So check this out. Let's say we have a math score, again, going back to the original sample score of 44. We take that, we, we get our skilled score of 740, we divide it by 10, and boom, we've got a 74. Now we take the writing score, 35 again, that was a 31, which became a 310. Now we divide it back by 10, and we multiply it by two. So the writing score is doubled. So it's almost like the writing section in and of itself has as much weight as the math section. Then we take our reading raw score of 39. That gave us a 330. So we divide it back by 10 and multiply that by two, and we get 66. So we add those three numbers, 74, 62, and 66 and that gives us a score of 202. So that's what we would use in every particular state to see if you qualify for a National Merit Scholarship, at least as a semifinalist. So now I'm gonna show you what scores you need to qualify, and this is based on last year, right? The indexes could change, they could shift up, they could shift down slightly, but this is how it is, and again, it depends by state. So here's the list of states. So again, if we remember, that score was 202. Now. That's actually a really good score, and it's going to get you in, at, if we translate it over to an actual SAT score, probably bump up to be in the, in the 1400s, and that's a really, really good score. But I just want to show you how competitive it is to get one of these scholarships. So the lowest that we have here is in West Virginia. If you live in West Virginia, you could get as low as a 207. But remember, that really good score with a composite qualifying score of 202, it wouldn't even qualify in West Virginia, so it's quite difficult. And just to show you, the most competitive state is actually Maryland, where you would need a 224. So I just wanna tell you, for people who are shooting for qualifying for a National Merit Scholarship, it's quite a tall task, and if you are gonna try and prep for that, it takes a lot of work. So I, a lot of times we'll say, hey, if you really think you're starting off close and you wanna put in that work and go for it, do it, but. I want to make sure you have realistic expectations about it. And by the way, even if you don't qualify, but you get a score like we saw, like a 202, that qualifying score may not hit the mark, but it's still a terrific score to show for really competitive colleges. Now, for National Merit Scholarships, there will be 7,500 finalists across the U.S., so it's not a big number. So now we're going to talk about what are possible scholarships you can get. So first, we have the standard National Merit Scholarship, and that's $2,500, a significant amount of money, and that doesn't matter about students' finances, college preferences, course of study, any of that stuff. Now, and again, this is just the qualifying part, right? So to actually get the scholarship, you're going to have to go through a process of writing an essay, going through different things that you need to do to qualify. But this is the first step. So if you qualify, this is one possible scholarship that you could get awarded. Another possible one would be a corporate sponsored merit scholarship, right? And these could be not just a one-time payment. It could be renewable. You could get it each and every year throughout your college experience. So it will depend on the corporate sponsor. Finally, we have college sponsored merit scholarship and this will be from the particular college that you've gained admission to. Now, it's important that the college that will 
potentially give this to you, they're only going to give it to you if you've noted that they're your first choice, right? So if that's the case, then they could potentially give you a college-sponsored merit scholarship based on this national merit qualification. All right, how do you register for the PSAT? Well, this is the nice part because this will be done through your high school. With When it comes to the actual SAT, you'll have to do that independently through the College Board website, but this will be taken care of through your school. If you want more information, I would highly recommend talking to your college counselor or college advisor. How do we study for the PSAT? Again, I don't want people freaking out about the PSAT because it is what it is. It's a practice SAT. So it's gonna give you a dry run of what it's like to take the test. It's gonna give you a baseline for how much studying you need to do in order to hit your target schools. And you can look all that stuff up in, on US News World and Report in terms of this is the 25th to 75th percentile that I need to get in, in terms of my SAT score to be competitive. So that's what the way you should generally be viewing this. Now, if you do want to prepare, if you do want to try for national merits qu qualification, things like that, or just go for it and do your best, I'm going to show you how to. But again, I don't want you stressing about this because that's not what the PSAT is about. So the first thing to remember is PSAT content is essentially the same as SAT content, right? It's the same writing, reading. It's just shorter. Okay, so that being said, if you want to prep, the first thing I would recommend is to watch our critical concept series. That's to get a baseline. Now, this is again for the math section, right? But in particular, if you want to shore up your math skills, you just watch the series. It's on our, it's the main thing on our YouTube channel. So I'm going to put a link in the description below if you want to check that out. But make sure it's four videos and you can just make sure to refresh your mind with all the important math concepts that you may have learned, you may have forgotten, some might be new, et cetera. So that's where I would start. Next, I would take a practice PSAT from the College Board website. You can download a paper version. It's totally free. So that will also be in the description link below as well if you want to check that out. I would highly recommend that as well. And then take as many practice SAT tests as possible. There's way more practice SAT tests available than practice PSAT test. So I would do that because again, like I said, the content is identical. It's just the PSAT is a little bit shorter. So places where you can do this is on Khan Academy. Once again, it's for free. You can create an account. You can keep track of all your scores, everything you got right, everything you got wrong, et cetera. And there's eight up there. So really good content up on Khan Academy. And we also have all the released tests, the QAS tests over the years on Reddit. So I'm going to post that in the link in the description below that link so you can check out these practice tests i use them all the time i've got walkthroughs on my youtube channel tons of them if you're new to the channel so you can check that stuff out and then again if you're talking about math preparation watch our math walkthrough videos okay so again my, this channel is mostly focused on math preparation for the sat act etc so that's what you what you'll find here but check, look around poke around on youtube and see what other good videos you can find that go over the verbal sections if you want to work on those as well. Next, we're going to talk about when is the PSAT offered each year. So it's usually offered in October. Right now, it's October, so that's why I'm making the video. And another important thing is scores are generally, generally released in early December. For this year, I believe it's going to be December 5th or 6th, but it might change every year depending on the day of the week, etc. In terms of the cost to take the PSAT, it is $18, but schools may cover this cost, so you may not even have to pay out of pocket. It might be, all be taken care of, but if you do, it's gonna be $18. Another thing you can do is for eligible high school juniors, you can get a fee waiver and take it for free, even if your school is trying to charge you for it. So that's something that you can reach out to the College Board and inquire about. Now let's talk about what you should bring to the PSAT to make sure you're fully prepared. And this is similar to what you should bring to the SAT as well. So I always say bring three number two pencils and have them be nicely sharpened. That's a bit excessive in a sense, like even when I always do that, I usually only use two, but you always wanna have a backup just so there's nothing that's gonna make you panic and make sure the erasers are good, et cetera, because you might need to erase stuff and you wanna do it cleanly so you don't have something go wrong with the score sheet. We also have a handheld pencil sharpener, not one that makes noise or electric, but just one that you can use in case you need it. So again, just as a backup, last time I took the SAT, there was a pencil sharpener in the room, but we don't know if that's gonna be the case or not. So just be prepared. You also wanna bring a nice healthy snack. I definitely would recommend staying away from sugary snacks because they can give you a spike and then a crash and you don't wanna do that. So a nice healthy snack 
with good protein, some good fat, uh, things like that. I was like almonds. I think those are a safe bet. I think you can do some carrots. You could do a little bit of cold cuts if you like some protein that way. So those are all good options. I think a silent watch is a great thing or something to keep track of the time so you have an idea of where you are and how much time you have left, etc. So that's a really positive thing. And you can't make noise. And if it does, you can even get kicked out of the test. So you want to be very careful about that. Water is super important. You want to stay hydrated. When it comes to drinking coffee or caffeinated beverages, it sort of depends on what your normal protocol is. If you're already doing it and this is what you do every time before a test, then okay, fine. You can have a little bit of coffee or something like that. But if you don't, now is not the time to start. This next part is kind of not so much important anymore, but it will sort of depend on where you're taking it, your school's policy, the test center's policy, like even this last SAT that I took, I saw some people show up in masks, but it wasn't mandatory. So if you are gonna wear a mask or if it is mandated at the current time, then just make sure to get a com comfortable mask, one that's breathable, one that's safe, all that stuff, and make sure you prepare for that. I would even recommend bringing a backup mask just in case. And then of course, you're gonna need your photo identification, even though it's at your school, make sure to have it just in case you do need it. Uh, a calculator as well for the calculator section. And now we're gonna talk about calculators that are acceptable. By the way, last but not least, extra batteries for your calculator if it is a battery operated calculator. I know the TA84, you just plug it in and charge it so that's no longer a thing. But if it is a battery operated calculator, definitely bring extra batteries if you can, just in case. So now let's talk about some College Board approved calculators. So we've got some lists, we got a bunch of these from Casio. So you can sort of look through and see, maybe you have one of these, or maybe you can look at this list and choose accordingly. We've also got all these from Texas Instruments. Again, I have the TI-84CE, I believe. I'm a big fan, or TI-84 plus CE. I think that's my model. I'm a big fan of that calculator, but you know, it's not so essential that you have this crazy graphing calculator. It's not that you need that. I just like it. I'm comfortable with it. So that's what I recommend. Uh, you can also get one from Sharp. These are the Sharp permitted calculators, HP permitted calculators, and these are the calculators from Radio Shack that are allowed. Finally, these are some other ones, Data X, Micronta, you know, whatever. So see what's available, see what it fits in your budget, and take it from there. That's it for everything you need to know about the PSAT. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And if you guys need any help on the tutoring side, make sure to hit us up at tutoring at scalarlearning.com. We'd love to help you. Also, check out our YouTube channel. Obviously, we have tons of content on the math side primarily. We also got some good English videos as well if you want to check that out. So I wish you guys all the best of luck. Hit us up. Drop us a like. Subscribe if you want to see more. And I will see you in the next video. Take it easy.